So we're going to talk about um, the office, uh, office management and fee, calcul- fee collection. So how do you run an office? So what's going to happen? What are the costs that are involved in running an office? So we're going to start first talk about financial management. Now this is based on the concept of having, um, of, of who you're going to have working for you and what are your costs? What are your salaries? What are your costs to operate and run this business? Now, I don't know if any of you guys in this room are going to go out and hang a shingle, you know, starting June 1st. But some of you might hang a shingle sooner than later. Or some of you guys might go in and work at a firm that's only got two or three people. And so this is helpful to try to understand about how much revenue needs to be generated. And when I first started teaching this class, this was actually new to me. This my predecessor put together this. Now, I've updated the spreadsheets and the numbers. Um, but it was kind of shocking of how much, when you start to actually think about it, how much money needs to come in, and then you look at, like, my firm, my firm has 300 plus lawyers, and how much revenue we have to generate a day to make our numbers, it's kind of quite staggering. So, so we talk about it here. For the small office here, we have, we have a group that has one principal, so just one main partner, and their salary is going to be making $175,000 a year. So we're obviously not working in the city of Chicago. You know, this is in the middle of the country, but making $175,000 because that's the owner of the business. You got two associates making $75,000 each, so that's $150,000 your cost. One senior architect and two junior architects at 65 and 110, 55 each, 110. And then you have a couple of beginners. So this is a staff of uh, two, four, six, eight people. So there's eight people that are revenue generators, but they're, these are their salaries or their costs. So you're looking at salaries, how much money you have to pay out is $570,000 per year. That's the first thing. Pardon me? What do I mean by what? Beginner somebody that just is like an intern that's not licensed, like you're going to come out and you're going to be a beginner. Or you may be an intern, or you may be, you're going to probably be higher, you're going to be up at a, at a junior architect or senior. And like I said, these, these salaries are not for the city of Chicago, but it's somebody that's just brand new, straight out, that doesn't know anything about the industry. And a, a beginner architect may be somebody that doesn't even have an education yet, but is just working and maybe is going to go back to school. So, um, okay, so you have $570,000 as far as your um, annual cost of salaries alone, plus your, your FICA. Another forty-five thousand dollars, and then health insurance. And these are all these are all like kind of pulled out of thin air type numbers. It, it, wherever you're going to be, if things are going to be higher. Most places aren't going to be lower. But this is just to show you if we had a small firm in a small town, what your costs are going to be. So you have costs on an annual basis of seven hundred fifteen thousand dollars just on your revenue generator employee side. Okay. On the side you office to run and manage the office. You're going to have a secretary. Now, the secretary here making 60, you're like, well, boy, that secretary makes a whole lot more than the junior architects. But one person running all the things to keep the office running along with the receptionist. And then your rent, $65,000 a year for your rent. You're going to have professional liability insurance, 70 grand a year for your insurance. You have to make sure that you're insured in case you get sued and you have to call me. Somebody's going to make sure that the insurance policy is there. Other insurance, so that may be auto insurance, that may be your commercial general liability in case somebody trips and falls on your doorstep. So other insurance, 15 grand. Um, three cars, so sometimes people have to, they, you know, they get a company car or they get the value of the use of a car, so we put a number in there. Printing, how much your printing costs? Every day you're printing stuff out, so we're just putting a ballpark here of 15,000. Um, phone and fax, although we don't have fax machines anymore, you can see it's been a little while since I've updated this. Um, uh, utility supplies, legal, my bills that are going to come for contracts and other stuff. Um, $25,000, obviously, I'm very cheap, very inexpensive. Um, not cheap, just inexpensive. Uh, accountant and then miscellaneous. So you're looking at another additional $380,000 of cost to run the physical plant. So you got, you got $715,000 to pay your revenue generators. And you got another $380,000 to actually keep the physical plan operating. So, you're going to take a look at it and you're going to say, okay, we have 40-hour work weeks. People are going to work an average of 58 weeks a year. People get your two weeks, your standard two-week vacation. So, how many hours of that? How many hours of that? That's 2,000 hours per person. 
If they're working every day at 40 hours a week for 50 weeks, they're going to be able to, and you want to say you want to bill 2,000 hours. Revenue generation of 2,000 hours. I will tell you this. To bill eight hours a day, you have to work 10 to 11 because you got your hour for lunch. You got a time switching from job to job. Sometimes it's, you're good. Sometimes you're working on just one project and that's all you're doing, so it's easy to do eight hours. Sometimes I get on a contract and I'm just doing the contract the whole day. But if I'm working on a contract and then I get a call from a client, I got to switch gears and I got to take a meeting, there's this downtime, there's this span. So you, you, eight, working eight hours doesn't necessarily translate to getting eight hours of billable. So just, that's just as an aside. Then it says, okay, you have eight people that are revenue generators. And if they're going to be billing, revenue generation billing, 2,000 hours per year, that means you have 16,000 revenue hours to generate revenue per year. Okay? So, in order to cover the, the $715,000 of your expenses, divided by that $16,000, you need to make sure that you are incurring or bringing in Every person, the average dollar figure for that is, is $44.69 an hour. So that's if everything was clean and perfect and everything else, to cover their own costs, you would be able to collect from every client roughly $45 an hour. Right? Which is really cheap if you think. An architect building at $45 an hour. But that's not the only cost. Now, obviously, on the other side, you have to run the physical plant. You have to pay your rent and your light and your attorneys and your sec secretary and receptionist. And so in that, you take your $380,000, you divide it by the 16,000 hours, and that's $23.75 an hour. So you add your $44.69 with your $23.75, and that means you need to generate $68.44 per every billable hour. And it's actually, it's not generate, it's collect. It's not generate, it's collect. So sometimes you're going to have someone, and you're going to send a bill to a client, and they're going to see this bill and they're going to say, you charge me three hours for photocopy? What do you mean? Your secretary should have done that. That's not a billable charge. Well, they had to do it because they had to do it. doesn't matter. I'm not going to pay for that. That's three hours that aren't going to be paid for. I have clients all the time that ask me. I don't actually, I'm trying to think if I've ever had a client that hasn't asked me for some discount at some point in time. There are some that are really good that pay my rates. But there are others that no matter what it is, no matter how big, how large, or whatever, they don't pay the rates. I'll give you a great example. I worked for Elon Musk. I worked for the Boring Company. Okay? The Boring Company came into the city of Chicago. They was this huge RFP to build the, the high-speed line from downtown Chicago to O'Hare. I don't know if anybody read about it. It was last spring. So we came in, and they needed help with the RFP, and that's my specialty. My boss and I, my specialty that I do this, I'm like... I'm like, that's my kind of, that's my go-to in the office. I know, I know RFPs better than anybody on both the owner side and how to respond to them. So Elon Musk and his team came in and they hired us. But it was on a trial basis and they said, what we want to do is, and they were scrambling at the very end, and we wanted to make sure that they could, um, uh, to respond to the RFP, so we put them together. So we actually agreed to do it for free. We would do this last three weeks of craziness, to get them to submit the bid to the city of Chicago, and we did it for free. Fine, that's part of marketing, that's how you get business and everything else. I don't know how many hours I put into it, but that's zero revenue generation. But every hour, and every hour that I didn't bill them for zero, I could have been making money on somebody else with the firm, but that's part of it. So none of these would have been revenue hours. And then we, they won the bid. They won it. They were going to build it. I don't know if I'm sure you guys read the paper, but that deal is now probably going south and it's not going to happen. So they brought us in to negotiate the contract. And we said, okay, we did that huge thing for you for free. Now we're going to do it for rack rates. Well, we were not going to pay you straight rack rates. We're not going to pay you. We're going to, we want a discount. So we put together a discount for them because it's a big project and it's a big idea. And everybody knows it's a big, you know, cachet and all this other stuff. He wouldn't even come close to paying our rates. We're like, look, we got you over the finish line. And I don't care who you are. I don't care that you guys are SpaceX and you put people in the middle. I don't care. Tesla. And we told him we weren't going to work for him. Because this guy wanted to have us so cheap. And that's what people are. It just happens. So, just because you have potential 2,000 revenue generated hours or 16,000 revenue generation hours doesn't mean you are going to collect. So, 
in order to make, simply to break even on this pro forma here, you must collect the equivalent of $68.44 per hour for every 16,000 billable hours. And nobody wants to operate a business where they have to make every single number and it's not going to end up in a profit because that means the business is flatlined, anything that goes bad, what happens if the lawsuit comes in, then your litigation costs are higher, so it's not 25000 it's 250000 so you can't operate that way. So, we go to the next page. We've got to make a profit. Okay, so if you want to have 20% profit, you're going to have to increase the value of every revenue generated hour from 68.44 to 82.13. So you're going to build into your model of how much you're charging your clients on an average basis per hour, $82.13. So let's just round it up to 85 bucks an hour. That's your average. So the principal is going to be charging higher. Your junior and beginner architects are going to be charging lower. But on an average, you need to collect $85 an hour for 16,000 hours on an annual basis so your firm has a 20% profit. It's simply math. It's numbers. You can see it. As I've said in the beginning a couple times in class, we're not going to have any math questions on the exam. I just want you guys to kind of recognize how these things happen. Okay? So, that's how you figure out what, your, what money you need to have coming in to cover your actual cost if you want to have a 20% profit on your business. And who doesn't want a profit? Because you want to give bonuses to people in your firm. You want to give a bonus to yourself. And, you know, really, honestly, a 20% profit on this business is actually probably not the way to think about it. You probably want to think about 30 or 40% profit because the what ifs. Like I said, that one lawsuit where it says in your line item $25,000 for legal fees could immediately become 10 times that much. A lawsuit in the city of Chicago is going to cost somewhere between two hundred and four hundred thousand dollars on the cheap side. You could have lawsuits if you want to take a lawsuit in Cook County. If you want to take a lawsuit to court, it's not going to be unreasonable to see fees in excess of a half a million dollars, maybe even upwards to a million dollars. I've been on lawsuits where I've had where the fees generated are over two million dollars over a period of four or five years. So. That's not built into this tiny little performer. Now, hopefully, the, 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 this small little firm isn't working in the spectrums where these cases are going to be that big and large. But if you only built in a 20% profit, that's going to be eaten up immediately by legal fees. You've got to kind of think about how you run the business, and you know, that's what you need to talk to. Okay, sustaining operations. All right, what do you need to fees to sustaining operations? So, again, we have your, you got your um, production costs, which is your $715,000. Those are the producers. There's your overhead. Um, and so that adds up to $1,095,000, which is roughly $91,250 a month. I'm sorry. Yeah, $91,250 a month. That's how much you are writing checks for every month. And this is a different way to kind of think about it. The first part was how much revenue you want to bring in. This is how much this revenue is going out on a, on a monthly basis, okay? Yeah, and then your profit. So your profit is actually now 1314000 If you want to make profit, that's it. And so what that is, is that actually is $109,000, $109,500 a month. That's that dollar figure that happens every single month. So you need then to sustain that, um, you're going to need to generate, collect $110,000 every month. You need to collect that every single month to be able to make your number. When you start to think about it, that means you're sending out bills, you're bringing in collections, sending out bills. This is for a tiny little firm, $100,000 per month. My firm needs to generate just under, it's like $800,000 per month. For our revenue, we have to make almost a million dollars a day. Actually, I'm sorry, I take that back. If you go by 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 calendar days, actually, we have to generate over a million dollars per day for our if it's if just by the calendar days, because our firm revenues, our firm generated revenue is somewhere about two hundred between two hundred twenty and two hundred thirty million dollars on an annual basis. So if you think about that, and there's about two hundred forty days of working days in a year. Okay, next page. Um, 
Now, this is if you just work with the people in your firm. You think about it, sometimes you're not going to be able to do all the electrical work and the, the mechanical work. You're going to have to hire a subconsultant. So the next page talks about you bring in a consultant fee. Those you are going to hire subconsultants. So that adds another figure on top of that. You're going to roughly, if you figure about a typical architecture project, the architecture, which is going to be your structural, your um, electrical, mechanical, and the architectural design, who's going to be working by the architecture firm, is roughly 65% of it. All the consultants you hire to support you is another 35%. That's, that's a typical breakdown of where your costs are. So for there, now what you're really looking at, because you've got to pay these consultants, you've got to pay them, is roughly $2,021,000 per year of your costs going out. So we've gone from $1.3 million to $2 million of writing checks or that you need to cover to generate the revenue. So, take all that in, you kind of calculate where the dollars are going to go. If you want to have a firm of eight people that are just generating normal architecture services, you're going to either need to collect $168,458 per month or $38,875 per week or $7,775 per day. You have to collect that just to make those bare minimum numbers. And that's when you start to figure out, when you said, and that's just a small little firm in the middle of the country. If you think about this, if you took these numbers and you put it into the city of Chicago and you said that eight person firm, this is, these numbers are probably going to triple. Well, maybe even larger, depending on what the fees are. You know, you're going to have the principal is going to be making, maybe theirs is not going to go from 375 to half a million, but you're going to have a principal that's going to be making, you know, $300,000, $400,000. And you're not going to be taking, paying the junior architects thirty-five thousand dollars a year. I don't know what you guys are. Go, what some of you guys probably have jobs, and I don't know what the, the market is when you're going out. But I, I imagine you guys are making more than thirty-five walking out the door at least right now. So I hope you are. Um, so those are just some some numbers to kind of think about of what it would cost to sustain operations. So how do you structure and how do you charge that? Okay. So when you now we now we kind of understand where the numbers are. How do you figure out what you're going to charge your client? What are you going to do when you enter into the agreement? And I've talked about this a little bit before in the past when we talked about the B101. So the first one that we look at in determining what your fees, the structure of the basis of fees, one, you can do it on the basis of the percentage of the construction costs. So instead of saying I'm going to do it by billable hour rate, what you're going to do is going to say the value of that project. And sometimes, and more often than not, as the projects in the small projects, or on the really big projects, um, you're going to generate more revenue based on the percentage of the construction cost. Or you come in and you give a lump sum fee. So you say, it's a $2 million project. I'm going to charge you 14% of that. Instead of, I'm, instead of tracking my hours, I'm going to charge you on a percent basis. Um, one of the things the question here is, are they acceptable, generally acceptable percentages? Different types of work have different percentages. If you're working in the residential market, depending on what type of residence it is, it can go anywhere between 6% of the fee all the way to 14 or 15% for high-end residential. If you're going to be working in the um, uh, commercial, traditional commercial real estate market, it's going to be uh, between 4% and 8%. 4% is really hard. If you remember, we did that pro forma on on the um, economic equation, that four and a half five percent showed that that profit, that business wouldn't be able to sustain itself. So you want to look at that. So and then depending, then you're an interior. So all different markets have different percentages of what they charge. So you have to you have to look at the area where you're charging. You know the area location of what the market rates are, the type of project it is, the clientele, and that's how you figure out what your percentage is. Um, and the issue of the dollar curve. Do you want to get more cash up front as opposed to you want to have a smooth line of payment? You want to think about when you have your money coming in. That's another thing you want to think about. It, it, it's traditionally in the construction, in the design side, you're going to have schematic phase, design development, construction document, bidding negotiation, and then construction administration phase. The SD, schematic design, is going to be 10 to 15 percent of your time spent in your project. The design development is going to be somewhere between 15 and 20. 
construction document phase is going to be roughly 40 to 45 percent. So sometimes, sometimes the design professionals will try to get money front loaded up front, even though they're not putting as many man hours into that, so they can use that to fund other projects and other things going on. But they have to make sure that they cover the revenue that they needed during the middle of the project. So when they actually have to put more people on the, more people actually doing the work, because the middle of that design is the construction document phase, the most intense, the most number of bodies that are working on it. Um, next, you got to think about is the client secure with it? Are they happy with the structure that you did? Percentages and talking about where the where the curve is. Um, ethical, ethical issues of cost overrun. What do you do when you're in a situation where you bid a project on a percent of the construction cost? So it's not tied to your work. It's tied to how much the project would be. So now you're in a situation where um, the project is bid at $2 million. You estimate it's going to be $2 million. You've told that, so you base your fees on that. Everybody's in agreement. We're all good. Goes out to bid, it's $2 million. Everybody's fine with that. Everybody thinks we know what's going on. And the contractor starts digging a hole and it turns out that there's an Indian burial ground there. Nobody knew. And that delays the project. And that costs more money because the contractor has to bring in people and everything else. And now the value of the project is $2.5 million. Ethically, nothing's changed for you. You're not doing any different work as the designer. The contractor has incurred more costs because they have to do all these things to take care of to properly remove and, and excavate the, the Indian burial ground or whatever it might be. And the owner has to pay for that because that's their responsibility. But you as the architect have not changed any of your services, but now you're getting an increase of 25% for this $500,000 increase to the value of the project. Is that ethical? How do you deal with that? I actually haven't had the situation where an architect has come to me where the owner's not paying them for this type of thing. But that's a question that can come up from time to time. If there are overruns on the project that are unrelated to the architect, is not the architect getting a windfall for those costs? Let me give you the flip side of, of that dilemma. Well, the architect still will be involved because the architect is still going to have to do things like manage the time, manage the schedule, manage the people, and make sure that there's paperwork. So the architect is not going to be doing nothing. So you just kind of have to balance that on an ethical question. Um, and then the other thing is, is this concept of construction cost, because it's a percentage of the cost of the work, not a percentage of your time. Or It's like, how do you figure out when you charge that? Well, obviously, before the construction even starts, you're going to give an estimate of the project and you base your fees on that. And then, is it, is it an all-in cost tied to the bid? Some projects I've had is where they say, we think the project is going to be $2 million, so we're going to do a percentage of that. And then when it goes to bid, and it comes in at 1-9 or 2-2, the owner says, okay, we're going to lock in your fee there. So you don't get into this ethical dilemma of cost overruns. And then when, a call, when the project increases in cost, then there will be a change order on an increase-by-increase increase basis. And so it's lockstep. Instead of saying, open-ended, we're going we're to figure it out at the back end. And so there's been different ways you can handle as far as your fee. The, the point of all this on this last point as far as the cost of construction when it's determined, two points. One, figure out what the rules are of when you are going to determine how you're going to get paid when you're negotiating the contract. That's number one. And number two, communicate when things change. Make sure that the owner understands when the project has a change order that increases it by a half million dollars, he's going to be writing you a bigger check. Make sure they understand that. So it's about communication. Next. You can do it on lump sum. Lump sum doesn't tie anything to the construction costs. And this is actually the one where there's fewer disputes than anything else because the architect says, I've done this house or these types of houses 600 times or whatever it is. I know how much this is going to cost me. The other thing it does for you as the architect is you don't have to show them what your timesheets are. You're going to keep your timesheets because you want to make sure you're paying your, your, your architect and your junior architect and everything else and properly for what they're doing. You've got to be able to manage your books. But you're saying, I'm going to design your, $200 million, your $2 million home for a $250,000 design fee. Done. You don't have to go through anything more. If you come back to me, owner, for additional changes, here's my schedule of billable hour rates. So if I have to add more time, I'm just going to bill you straight hourly. 
That's simple, clean, easy. And then you take that $200,000 and you say, 15% I'm going to bill you at SD, another 20% at BD, another 45% at SD, five at, at bidding negotiation, and the remainder closing out the project. So everybody knows when those dollars are going to be paid out for the $200,000 lump sum fee. Simple, straightforward, and basic. Okay? And then it talks about here, it says, you've got to assess your own overhead and profit. You're going to figure out if I need to generate that $2 million per year, that means I need to have 10 projects a year that generates a $200,000 fee. I've got to have 10 $2 million houses. Or I've got to have 8 $2 million houses and one $4 million house. Or whatever your business is. And that's how you budget your time and, your, and figure out your cost. And then you look at your history your previous history, what you think is coming down the pike and going forward, and that's how you can figure out what you're going to be charging your clients on a lump sum basis. And then the last one is, is an hourly basis. We're just going to charge you on an hourly rate. So when we did my kitchen expansion, the architect just said, however many hours I put in, I'm going to bill you at this rate. And it was pretty simple. Straight up hourly bills. That's all the timesheets and we were done. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. Let's get to this. So on the terminating fees, the next slide we have is this thing called the multiplier. Um, and this multiplier is what you need to, when you're starting to determine how much you need to charge per person, this is a different way to think about it and factor in, is um, sometimes it's, you take as a kind of a standard across the board, two and a half times my payroll. So I'm going to say, all right, to, to get that cost, it's two and a half times my payroll. 40% of labor, then you have 40% of overhead, and 20% profit. So you need to include all those dollars figures in. So if we have this calculation here of a principal, now this is even lower. This is a slide, obviously I did nothing from the other one. We have a principal at 120 an hour. The project manager is $90 an hour. This is what their, their rates are that they're charging. These are their hourly rates they're charging. Job captain, 75, architect after going down through. So you have an averaging can you average it at $65 an hour? Can you add those all together and just say, I want an average rate of $65 an hour? Maybe, maybe not. If the principal is only there two or three times a week versus the drafter is doing all the time, it's not really the proper way to average. So you kind of have to look at your numbers um, and where your revenues generated, where your costs are, where the most hours are being billed, and that's when you figure out how you can get to make sure that you get your two and a half times payroll plus the other percentages on top. Um, next page has a payment schedule. This is what I was talking about is if you want to take here. So let's say this, is a, this, this schedule here is based on a uh, $600,000 fee. Um, and then you're going to have, out of that $600,000, that's what you're charging the clients. You can remove one-third of that because that's what you're going to be paying off. You're not going to be collecting that one-third. That's what you're paying consultants. So you're going to be generating for yourself $400,000 of income coming in. So you want to figure out, when do I get paid? I want to make sure that my payment, my cash flow coming in, corresponds to my cost of paying my workers, my draftsman, my senior architect. And so you take a look at how many months the project is, and how you want to split up that $400,000. So if you think about it, if the schematic design for this project, so this is a project that's going to be two, four, eight, nine. So this is a project that's roughly 21 months from start to finish. So you're going to have two months of schematic design, two months of design development, four months of preparing construction documents, one month of the um, bidding and negotiations, and then 12 months of construction when you're on the side. So that's your 21 months total that this project from start to finish is going to be. So you take your $400,000 and you figure out how am I going to spread that revenue coming in over those 21 months. And so you have your fees and you take, okay, if you're going to take 60000 80000 you, you just take your percentages, that 400000 and you multiply those percentages, that's what the fee column is. And then you can tell the client, this is how I want my payments to come in. For the first two months, I'm going to be billing you 30000 a month. The next two months, I'm going to be billing you 40000 a month because we're amping up the number of people. The next month, it's going to be another 40000 for four months and so forth. So that's how you go ahead and calculate 
your revenue coming in. And you understand that that's where your dollars are coming in because at the same time you have dollars going out. Simple, very basic performer that you want to look at in running the business. Any questions on that? Okay. Fee productions and costs. So, this is if you're doing a percentage of the construction contract, the value of the contract. Assume the project has approximately $12 million in construction costs. So this is kind of a little example here. Um, and you have a 4% design fee. As we talked about earlier, 4% is probably never going to be enough to make the money, certainly in this area, that you can make a profit. But we'll just use that as an example. So you have a 4% design fee. How do you budget the amount of hours to be able to spend to be remain profitable? So if you've got a 4% design fee of a $12 million project, you're going to get $480,000 as your design fee. Now, you're going to have to take away your structural engineer. That's one of your consultants. So you're going to knock off another 12.5%. So of that 480 of that you're going to be collecting from the client, you're removing 60,000. Mechanical engineer, another consultant, you knock out another 20 some percent. And that's $105,000. So that's your one third of your one third of your $480,000 is gone. Um, spec writer. Spec writer is the individual that you pay to actually write up the written specs. And some people, a lot of times that is, doesn't come in because you have them kind of canned in your system, but there may be specialty parts of the project where they actually have to write a spec and the spec is somebody you hire outside. Um, and the same, the coordinating of the engineers, the coordination between the mechanical, electrical, civil, all these engineers. These are your costs. So you're losing, and then your 96%, um, $96,000 for your 20% profit. So you now have $198,000 to design the entire project, to pay your workers to do all of this work. Okay? Remember way back when, when we were doing our math, we figured out that the value of the revenue generation hour was $68.44. So if you have $198,000 to work with, at $68.44, that means you have to devote 2,800, or you have available to you 2,893 hours to design this project. Okay? You have to get all of the design, all of the work, everything, SD, DD, CD, bidding and negotiation, and construction administration, all of that has to be done in order for you to make a profit at a 4% fee in 2,893 hours. You follow on this? Okay. So the next page is, let's take a look at what you have here. One person working, one person working for eight weeks is going to be 320 hours. Now you go to DD, you got to double it up. You got two people working for eight weeks, add another 640 hours. You get construction document, you're going to put another person on the team because it's the bulk of it. That's where you're going to put your bulk in. And that's 16 weeks of the project. So that's how much your time that's going to be in. Now you're at 19,020 hours. That's average 120 hours for 16 weeks. And is that really enough? Are they working that much on it? Okay, bidding and negotiation, one person four weeks, 160 hours, and then construction, a quarter of a person, that means one week out of the month for 52 weeks, okay? So that's 1,560 hours. This project says you need 4,600 hours to do the project. The math we just did at a 4% fee said all you have is 2,893 hours. That means you are 1,700 hours over budget. There is no way you would lose your shirt on this if you charged only a 4% fee. It's for this one project, what it calculates out to be is a $116,827,000 loss. So we know that a 4% fee for this basic $12 million uh, building 4% fee, you would lose $117,000. You can't charge 4%. If you moved it up, the next page, if you try to move this thing up to 6.5% of the cost of construction, now you are looking in and you can generate revenue and if you run through the same numbers as we did before, now you find out that you actually have 4,000 when you do your calculation 4,523 hours as opposed to 2,893 hours. And so you have 
time to do the project. You have the budget because what we budgeted was, or the cost, we thought it was going to be 4,600. It's going to be really close. You get 4,523 versus 4,600. You probably could do this and make your, maybe it would be a full 20% profit, maybe it'd be 18, 17% profit. So it's even 6.5% enough. Sometimes you can work on shaving how much time you're going to be putting. Maybe you can only have one person doing the design development, or maybe one and a half people. Maybe a person only works half a week on it. So these are the things that the owner starts to look at when they're looking at um, what, what we all call now the metrics of how much people, how many hours they're working, how much it costs the company per hour, and how much revenue is being generated. So you have to kind of think about that. And, and a lot of this I know is kind of like all up in the air for you guys because it has really very little to do with what you're doing in design and those types of things. And most of you guys are like, you know, I'm never going to be looking at these types of numbers for a number of years when I get out there. But you'll be surprised when you start working, especially at a small firm, how quickly the concept of numbers and what you're doing and how efficient you are as an individual working for the firm impacts what's going on in the firm. One of the things that um, happens with in my industry, and so it's the same because mine is a build of our industry just as yours are, is while my associates' rates may be half or a little bit more than half of what I bill per hour, the clients often will want to pay for my time because I'm more than double the efficiency. They would rather pay my high hourly rate than have an associate have to figure out how to learn how to do that. But then you, as the person running the business, need to figure out, okay, if my associate is operating traditionally at a loss, even though they're generating revenue, because their revenue isn't necessarily 100% collectible, how do I figure out where they're efficient and where they can be a revenue generator and where do we slot them in to this, are they going to be working SD, DD? You're probably going to put them on the construction document phase where you have some more flexibility. Where do you slot people based on your ability or need to generate revenue? Okay. Next page. Marketing and fees. Um, so you want to think about why would you want to, why would the collection, so think about where you're going out of marketing and concepts here. Um, why would the client select you as an architect? So A, they know you. They know your work or your recommendation. Those are the three main ways to generate business. And so what you need to do in your marketing strategy is figure out how you can fill those different slots. And you want to think about if they know you or they're recommended to you or they know your work, when is the right time to use and to go in and talk to them? It, there is a client that I've been working on for five years. I know one of the attorneys that works for their, their organization. He, he knows the person that does construction. I know I'm not going to get business from them this year. I'm not going to get, I didn't get business from them last year. Probably not going to get business from them next year because they have construction counsel that has been with them for, for over a decade. And that's already established. So I know the person. The person knows my work. I don't need to be recommended. But I have to figure out where my marketing dollars are, how much time I spend with them, because it's the long game. So you have to kind of figure out those types of things. Um, so when they know you, how do you, get to, how do you expand on the know you? Well, you've got to widen your circle. You've got to talk to more people. If this person likes you, they talk to you and everything else. Um, sometimes you want to go and join organizations. That's another way for people to get to know you. Uh, one of the reasons why I teach is for people to get to know me. And so someday when you guys, 10 years from now, you want to call me up. That's a different way to get to know people. Um, write articles for you guys do competitions. Ways to get involved and get your name out there in the industry. Know your work. Well, it's hard in the beginning when you guys are starting for people to know your design work because you're not going to be the lead architect. Um, but maybe you're part of a team. Or, again, another thing is you could des a design competition, um, organizations, your professional activities. Again, so they start to figure out and know who you're with. Uh, you know, but one of the greatest things about when I, and it, granted it was 24 years ago or 23 years ago when I laddered over to my group, like to, to Shepard and I was at a different firm, um, they already had a very established reputation in the industry, in the, in the construction world. And so I got the immediately immediate cachet of going over with them um, because I was associated with a group that had a good reputation. Same thing with you guys as far as knowing your work. Uh, and then the next thing is... Um, 
as far as um, recommendations, that's going to come from knowing your work or for knowing people, you're going to get recommendations. I have a, a, a gentleman who liked something that I did. He was not my client. He was a, he was a, a consultant for one of my clients, and he made recommendations of me to other people. And so that's something that can happen there. Um, there's a difference also between marketing and selling um, that you guys want to think about here. And, and how, and, and timing as far as is what you want to do to get that client. Marketing can be, can be kind of mass blasting and everything else there. And there's some people that take that, that, that kind of, you know, throw everything up there and see what you get. Advertise in every trade journal, advertise in everything else. There are other ones, and studies are different on different things. But studies are showing more that uh, if you're going to go in and you want to find a type, you want to, obviously, specialization is important. But probably one of the most important things is the timing. Is even if you have, like I said, this client, this potential client that I've not had, someday I'm going to get work from them. I know that because I've given them enough information. I've given them articles. I've given them actually opinions. There was one time where they had an, they needed an opinion that they didn't think that their lawyer was giving them the right straight up answer. They wanted a second opinion. I did that all for free. So you need to make sure that when the time is right. So my marketing for them is a, is a personalization. Other marketing that I have is just kind of going out in the industry and speaking, and I'll speak to trade organizations and things like that. So there's different types of things. Um, versus selling, again, selling could be as far as when you're talking to them individually or how you present. Um, sometimes selling can be, well, I have your politics. It's how you work the political game, political angle. Um, one of my bosses is, is incredible at that. He will find someone in an organization that has nothing to do with hiring the construction people, and he will work the political moves within that company to find the right people to talk to. He's very, very good at that. So there's different things you want to do. Um, then once you get to the client, you've got to figure out, as what we were talking earlier about, what's your fee and how do you charge. Um, and then the last thing here is other final, when you finally get that client, when you're finally in a situation where you need to send that con enter the contract, just think about these, what I have here is the terms of the deal. Um, what's included and what is not included in the fee. Make sure that's understood up front, what you're going to be charging, what's, what they get in return, and what's not. The AIA documents, as I've shown you, is really good because they say, here's what your basic services are, and then there's that chart in Article 4.1 of all the additional services, and you define what's in and what's not in for the fee. Um, when are you getting paid? Front-loaded, spread out over time that chart that we had here today that shows when you want your revenue generated during the course of that project. Um, what do you charge for reimbursable expenses? If I have to take a taxi cab or I go out for a meal or I have to fly to the job site, do I just charge you the actual cost or is it cost plus 10%, cost plus 15%? What can you get for that? You need to make sure that's up front in the contract. Um, what do you define your scope of work? Again, that was you want to look for the terms of the contract. I'm going to do, do the following. I have right now, an, I'm in a negotiation where there are two designers and they both submitted proposals and they're both going to be working. And both proposals said that they were the consultant and they were going to be looking to the other designer as the lead architect. Both of them said that. They both were pointing at each other saying, you're the lead architect, no, you're the lead architect. And I went back to my client as the owner and I said, you're going to pay both of these companies millions of dollars for their fees. Who's the lead? And they said to me, well, when we brought them on board a year ago, this company was the lead because we had a relationship with them and we thought they were going to be the lead. But we now have a better feeling of the new company that we hadn't worked for, so we've transferred the business to them as a lead. And I said, I don't think either of them know that because they're both saying the other team's the lead. We need to define the scope. And so now that's what I'm hashing out with them. I, sent a, I actually sent an email to one of, the, one of the principal designers two days ago that said, have you seen this document? Because this is the document that shows what you are supposed to be doing on this project. I had presumed, since my client gave it to me, that they had talked about it with the architect. And he said, no, I've never seen this. It was a 14-page document. It was called a Division of Responsibility. He'd never seen it. I'm like, you need to read this. You need to make sure this is what you think you're doing on this project, because if not, we're in trouble. So, you've got to make sure you get the scope of the work defined. Um, and then, special cases, how many times you're going to be on site, how many times you're going to be reviewing, 
change orders, uh, change RFIs, those types of things. I'm going to see for substantial completion. And then again, the last part is, is what's the form of the contract? Is it going to be written? Is it going to be handshake? Um, obviously, my promotion to you guys is it needs to be right. And that's it. Any questions for today? Okay. Next week, copyrights. Uh, it's just one subject. We'll, we'll blow through that. I will give you the contract. I will release you. And then two weeks, we'll have the exam. All right? Thanks, guys. Yes.